Hello, everybody. The date is Thursday, the 9th of February, and this is the Gypsy Jazz Club special hangout. Today, we've got a really special guest, John Jorgensen, a wonderful guitarist, multi-instrumentalist, done a lot of stuff. He knows a lot of stuff. We can all learn from him. So I'm really honored that he's here on the call. John, how are you, man? Good morning. Uh, very good. Thank you. It's, you know, uh, as you said, the date today it reminded me that you know, this is kind of in America, this is kind of Beatles launch day, you know, February 9th is when everybody in America got to see the Beatles on TV. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good day, right? No way. Was that, you mean the Ed Sullivan show? That Yep. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. What a day. What a, what a, what a day that changed, that changed the whole course of music in the States. Everything. And, and, yeah. The world really. You know, I mean, I probably, I mean, maybe I'd play guitar if not for the Beatles, but I don't know. Maybe not. You know? Yeah. No, I think that goes for me too. John, I know time's short, so let's get down to it. You're going to be our special guest in Los Angeles at our retreat or our Gypsy Jazz Breakthrough Retreat. You're going to be teaching and also performing with the students. Um, tell, tell, tell me what kind of how do you teach gypsy jazz in a session what 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 do you what do you how do what do you want to get students learning well what i first do is you know i just try to assess you know the the level of, of students you know to see where they're at and um then then i usually try to cover some rhythm you know techniques and some lead techniques what what I like to do is try to like teach everybody some, um, not so much a lick or, or a little technique, but something musical that they can carry on to whatever they're gonna play, you know, whatever style of music or whatever song or anything, just that kind of thing. Cause I, I, I feel like that's gonna be the most valuable. And, and those kind of things, as you know, they just come from experience more than like a book or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, that, that's a really good point. And just by the way, we're really excited to see you in LA and I think it's going to be fun. We've got a small in intimate group together. Um, people who just want to learn and kind of soak up the people perhaps who don't get the opportunity, John, to play with other people and, and jam this music, which is a big part of this music. Sit oh yeah jamming right and that's like yeah. you, said, you pick so much up from that experience from other players around you um it's going to be great to actually you know do this little gig at the at the house concert that we're doing at joe and justine's up in la um so we are really excited to have you there john let's just start with your um musical journey how you came to Django reiner and this music just shortly how, how did you get into it yeah, quickly. Well, uh, so I, I first, my family is very musical. My mom's a piano teacher and my dad is a conductor. So uh, I started playing the piano when I was four and the clarinet when I was seven, I guess, and then saw the Beatles. So the guitar came in um, and all through my career or my training or whatever, I was always uh, studying classical music on the clarinet or the bassoon or the piano and playing in orchestras and wind ensembles and then eventually jazz ensembles. And at the same time, parallel, I was in bands with my friends, rock bands, playing guitar. So uh, I always could read music and I always could play by ear. And I, I don't really differentiate, you know, they're, they're both really important and valid and one can support the other. Um, so eventually I got a degree in woodwind performance on bassoon, clarinet, and saxophone and graduated college. And then I needed a job, you know? So uh, I ended up getting a job at Disneyland in California playing bluegrass mandolin and Dixieland clarinet. Now, I didn't know really either one of those things. I, I could play the clarinet classical, but I didn't know Dixieland and I didn't even like it really. And bluegrass I liked, but I didn't know. So uh, I just took the job and I learned on the job. And meeting a lot of people that were into the Dixieland and traditional jazz, I started to develop 
uh, more of a liking for it and realized it was not the corny Dixieland music that I'd been brought up hearing. And I heard, you know, Louis Armstrong and then started hearing the guitarists, you know, like Eddie Lang and, and of course, Charlie Christian and, and all of those. And the, the banjo player that I was playing with was really a virtuoso. And he could play Harry Reeser stuff on the four string tenor banjo. He could play Eddie Peabody stuff on the plectrum banjo. And he could play Earl Scruggs stuff on the five string banjo. And he got so much attention for all of his flash and you know all this stuff. I thought there's got to be a guitar player that has that same, you know, flash and fire. And so everybody I asked, they kept saying the name Django Reinhardt. And with such a reverence, you know, like, oh, you got to hear him. And at the same time, I was seeing in interviews from Jeff Beck, from uh, Doc Watson, even uh, Chet Atkins, George Benson, all these other guitarists and other, you know, they would always cite Django as their hero. So, you know, so I went to a record store, which they had back then, uh, and I found an album. And the first album I bought was the wrong one because it was sort of a rarities album with like the slide whistle and the, you know, banjo and stuff like that. And I, I was like, nah, I don't know about this. <laughs> and then I then I found the one uh, I think it was City Lights was the compilation company, and it was all the classic great stuff of the quintet, you know. And and I just kind of lost my mind, you know, here and all of that after you've gone and Limehouse Blues and all that and the tone and the fire and everything about it was unique to me, and it was exactly what I wanted a guitarist that was like. You know, yeah. as exciting as Jimi Hendrix on the electric guitar, Django Reinhardt was on the acoustic guitar. Yeah. And until then, I didn't know that that was possible. Because the, the, the other guitarists of the time period that I'd heard were great, but they were tame. You know, they weren't wild. They were reserved. And then you get Django and he's like, holy crap, you know. So that was 1979 or 80. And Howard Alden was one of my friends back then. He was just barely switching from banjo to guitar. So, you know, we sh showed each other some stuff. And, and uh, I just got bit, you know. I just, I had to start learning. And so I, I bought a, an Epiphone arch top, which was not good for this playing this music but it was something and uh then i went on the search and, and found a an original selmer for sale unbelievably in los angeles and wow um and so my gig at disneyland which was half the day was playing bluegrass half the day was playing dixieland i convinced the bosses to let us create a third group and that would be, it ended up being three guitars and bass. And we would do instrumentals like Django. And we would do vocals like uh, Nat King Cole Trio and the Boswell Sisters and those kind of things. So that was way back in 1981, 82, something like that. And I'm, I never thought at that time that I'd be able to make it like a career. Yeah. Because there was no place to play. You know, there was no, nobody really, especially in, in the U.S. I know in Europe it's a bit different, but in the U.S. nobody knew the music. There was no venues. There was uh, nothing. So I figured that it would just be like my hobby music, you know, that I would just play it for myself and my friends. And then I would, you know, play other styles of music to make a living. Right. And then, as you know, when the internet kind of happened and chat groups and those kind of things. And then Del Arte and Chaton started making affordable versions of the guitars that you could buy in the US. Yeah. And then of course, Django Fest Northwest, right. which you helped start with Nick Lair, um, you know, that really kind of kicked off a whole scene in America around, around what, 2000 or something like that. 
And by 2003, I was, you know, I finished an album, Franco American Swing, and I was able, I got the chance to play Django in the film. Yeah. And that really kicked off uh, my ability to tour and perform this music basically full time. And, and, and since then, as you know, the, the, the interest in the style goes up and goes down. And, but sure. it exists, obviously, as all of you are here today around the world. Um, I'm just uh, so grateful that that happened. And I, I thank you for your part in all of that with your instruction books and your presence and festivals and all that kind of stuff because it's it took a lot of people to shine a light on this music and you continue to do that yeah that's cool john yeah i appreciate that and and you too i see you as someone you know a great ambassador for this music and being an american like you are and a guy who grew up with normal music you know beatles and and this stuff to, <laughs> to be touring you know with a gypsy guitar um is fantastic and i love the way that you do it in your own way you write a lot of your tunes um you've got you know you got drums you got fiddle you do you you fuse the music with other things which i think as you and i know we're not going to be ripping borelli and jimmy rosenberg to shreds we've got to do our own thing and that, you know, <laughs> exactly that's what, I, that's what i always try and tell guys i say look there's 99 percent chance that you're not going to be ever going to be playing as fast as those guys or as good as those guys. So try to develop your own sound, whatever music you're coming from. Um, I think that's a really important thing. I totally agree. And, and you know, uh, I took some inspiration from you in that way and also from Roman, uh, hearing his compositions. You know, I think the, the first time I went to Samoa, he was one of the artists. Um, you were there, but you were you were not on the stage yet, I don't think. Right. But um, hearing him with his concrete doing songs that sounded as if they could be a, a standard, you know, in that style, that was inspiring too. I mean. And and then when I started to tour and play this music, um, I found I would have been happy to be like a Django tribute band, you know, that would have been fine for me. But I found that, you know, doing a whole set like that, people would get bored and they, you know, they, so I started filling it out with my own compositions, basically just to kind of try to change it up a little bit. And yeah. then the response became bigger to the songs that I would compose. And the more almost the more out there or the more different influences that I bring into it, the more the audience would like it. And then when I would go back to a more traditional quintet type sound, it would sound fresher and more appealing to the audience too. You know? Yeah, it's amazing. You can guarantee if we do a gig, if we play one Beatles tune or one ACDC tune or, or the, the Tainted Love that we got from the Lost Fingers, you can guarantee that that's what the people you talk to after the show will say, but when you played that song, that's that sounded so cool. And I think we both know that. Yeah, it, it exactly. Well, it also gives like a, a familiarity. The, the It gives the audience something to latch on to. Exactly. You know? and, and they feel good. Oh, I know something. You know, they, cause I, I think as an audience member, I know if I went to see bands that I like, and they didn't play any songs I knew. You know, it, it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, I'm going to ask you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go We've got a lot, a go lot of people typed in questions. So let's go for short answers and um, let's try and answer as many of these as possible. We've got a couple of people asking about the clarinet. Uh, Dave Wave says you started on clarinet, the guitar. Brett Hoskins says, John, we met in London nearly 20 years ago. You played clarinet as well as you play guitar, which is your go-to instrument in a few words? I'd have to say the guitar. I mean, I love playing the clarinet, but I don't sit around and play it by myself. Got it. You know, it's... Next question. Uh, this is from Thad in Texas. Are the Helicasters still around? 
Uh, uh, unfortunately, no. Jerry Donahue was, you know, the, the Helicasters, for those who don't know, were three guitarists, myself, Will Ray, and Jerry Donahue. And Jerry, unfortunately, had a pretty severe stroke, so he can't play anymore. Um, his right side doesn't work. He doesn't speak anymore. And the whole ethos of the band was these three different styles that could meet in the middle. And so Jerry's, he really had a kind of a Celtic bent to his playing and, and to, to try to either replace him or to do it without that. Um, mm. It's unlikely. I mean, I've toyed with the idea every now and then of, of putting something else together like that, but I don't know. I feel like I'm so proud of what it was that, yeah. yeah I, <laughs> And uh, it, it, if everybody could just take a minute and just send out some love to Jerry Donahue, that, that would, that'd be awesome. You know? Got it. It's, got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think is Jerry Donahue, the guy that did the claw that, the. Yep. Yeah. He, the he's the one he's, he's American, but he also grew up in England. So he was kind of our bridge. And for those yeah. of you who don't know, he played with Fairport convention, Joan Armand trading, Jerry Rafferty, uh, such a unique bending style, just amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Next question. Um, Wenk, Wenko in, in, in the Netherlands says, hi, John, have you ever worked with Richard Thompson? Oh, no, I, I haven't. I've been on a festival. It's funny you would mention that because I just, Jerry replaced Richard Thompson in Fairport Convention. And I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think of, of solo singer, songwriter, guitarists, he accompanies himself like no one else. It's, it's, it's amazing. You could almost take away the lyrics and the singing and it would be enough interest just in what he plays. I, I think he's fantastic. And if you know him, tell him, let's do something. <laughs> Got it. Um, here's another one from Thad. He says, the movie you were in, how much footage of you was actually filmed aside from your 15 seconds? Oh, well, they, they, filmed, they filmed the whole song, the two songs, uh, all of Minder Swing and all of Blue Drag. And um, there was multiple takes. I mean, we were there most of the day filming. And so, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm sure there's enough footage for, to show the whole song. And uh, just so everybody knows, we pre-recorded the songs and you know tried to replicate them as close as possible to the original recordings and then they played it back and we we synced to it and when i went to the premiere i was horrified to see in minor swing the, the sync is like one beat off or an eighth note off or something like that because we were really concentrating on you know being right with the sync and you you can see the ending but it's da -da 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 -da, and our hands are Anyway, so there right, you go. right, got it. And and just for everybody, that film is called Head in the Clouds, right? Yes, with my two co-stars, Charlize Theron and Penelope Cruz. Right. And I'll tell you what, sitting in the makeup chair in between those two was uh, that that was a, a big experience. <laughs> Beautiful, John. Beautiful, John. <laughs> Um, here's a good one from Rome. Rome Bloomfield says, would be nice to know what live equipment John prefers to use when he's using his gypsy guitar. Does he still use a tone dexter and maybe what other effects, if any, for his live rig, favorite amp? What's your gypsy? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I haven't been using an amp on stage for a while. Uh, if I do use one, it would likely be either a Schertler uh, or a... Um, the Heinrich Henriksen bud, you know, it's a nice little amp or the um, Phil Jones has a really tiny one. That's cool. Uh, but most of the time I'm, I'm flying, so I can't really take an amp. And so I do go through the monitors. I use the tone Dexter and uh, it, a big tone type of pickup to drive the tone Dexter. And then lately I've been using a, uh, a Schertler preamp, uh, it's called a yellow, but it's blue, mm, go figure. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, I use that to shape the tone a little bit because every monitor system is different and it could be either harsh or boomy or whatever. And 
And I find that that helps. And then I'll also usually use a reverb pedal, either a Boss or Digitech reverb pedal that I will uh, kick in from time to time. It, it, it makes the bazooki sound much better. And like ballads, it's nice for the guitar too. Beautiful, man, beautiful. Um, Jeff Tratton, uh, Jeff Tratton, our friend uh, in the club says, John, I love your songwriting and your solos are always so unique and original. How do you come up with your solos? Um, thank you. That's, that's really kind. Um, I try to, you know, my whole soloing kind of uh, ideas come a lot from Beatles records and pop records and things where the solo would stay in my mind. So I try to have, I try to have it be melodic, fit nicely over the chords, and also hopefully a little bit of flash somewhere. Um, often I can hear, I can hear the licks that I want to do, but I might not be able to do them instantly. You know, so sometimes I have to work out the lick and then I'll, then I'll, I'll punch it in. So Got it. I, I like to craft them. You know, yeah. I, I like, yeah. Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, here's the next question from Yessie Walker, who's in New York. Any thoughts on why there are so few, if any, African-American musicians playing this music? Oh, I have no idea. Um, maybe it's just uh, culturally, they don't really hear it very much. You know, it's, it's not part of their, because let's face it, I mean, to find this music, it's not easy. I mean, maybe now you'll hear it in commercials on television or something like that, but it's usually kind of a cheesy version and not something that would get you excited. So if your friends don't show you or your dad doesn't show you or something like yeah. that, uh, I think it's probably just because they don't, they don't get a chance to hear it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Dig it. Good answer. Um, John Silver says, do you play guitar by yourself? Yes. Uh, very often. Uh, quite often, sometimes just to entertain myself, sometimes to learn new things, sometimes to write. Um, like I've, I've, got, I've got a show strangely coming up in uh, the end of this, next month, actually, where I, I have to play some Queen songs. Mm. So I've been getting a little bit of my Brian May off. So there, yeah, it's fun. That's awesome. Larry Cuedo. <laughs> in Canada says, John, love your compositions, Mirror in the Blue and In Memory of Danny Gatton, especially. Any thoughts you can share about them? Oh, well, <laughs> in, in, in memory of Danny Gatton, thank you, first of all. That's really kind. Uh, literally the morning that I heard about his death, um, I, I immediately went to the guitar and that the opening phrases just came to me like immediately. So they were one of those things. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes I believe you get a, you're in a channel and you get a gift from the universe because I don't know the, the way those notes are put together is not something that I play all the time or was really part of my stash of licks or anything. So right. it, it was pure emotion that channeled through the sadness of the moment. Uh, yeah. And, and then Mirror in Blue, I, um, I think I just wanted to, to write something emotional that evoked the same kind of emotions that when I would hear kind of a haunting ballad in this style with the unique chord changes and things that would be, that are part of Gypsy Jazz, the Diminish and the Minor Six and those kind of things. Yeah, beautiful. Both beautiful songs. Wayne says, uh, Wayne's in Colorado. He says, your song, One Stolen Night, is so beautiful. Is there a chart available anywhere? Not that I know of. I, I've never charted it out. Um, it's my wife's favorite composition of mine. Okay. She really, really loves it. And uh, it's, I just finished a little tour with my quintet and uh we have Casey Driscoll on violin. Rory Hoffman plays accordion on that. 
and then Rick Reed on percussion and Simon Planting, who he made me promise to, to give you a hard time today, which so <laughs> we'll we'll say this is that version. <laughs> and yeah, uh, got it. I know I he always would love. Oh yeah, he would he definitely, but I it's always uh, kind of magical to see the audience um, live. That song has a lot of dynamics and the, the ensemble is very, that's something that I'll cover in the workshop is dynamics because people don't use that enough, I think. And it's not hard. It's just something you have to think of. But, that's a great yeah. point. I, I, I say exactly the same thing. I said, we don't actually have to learn anything new or, technical it's literally just a, a mindset thing of let's bring it down let's bring it up it can be so yeah. powerful in performances and usually people just go bang through on one level yep i think it's because so many of us maybe learned guitar with from rock and blues and often the songs do stay at one kind of level and uh, right. classical music and and to, you know jazz and all different other kind of things this just dynamics are just so normal you know yeah so, anyway absolutely kai who's a great guitarist in the club from germany he asks uh you did a, an instruction book uh were the more volumes coming out the, the it seems to be only one or is the more the there's actually two and there it, it says on them that there are three but the the company that was doing them it went away and uh right. I, I i think the deal was in the third one we were going to try to actually use some of django's solos in in some copyrighted compositions and it it wasn't we weren't able to do it and then the company went away so there's two and uh I'm doubtful that there'll be a third i i, I don't have the inspiration to do that these days sure. Uh, Kai's got a follow-up question. Uh, he says, "Will you perform? Will you be performing in Europe in the near future?" Um, I am coming to Italy in March. Um, five or six dates in Italy between the twelfth and the twentieth. Um, that's going to be electric guitar. Uh, I've got an electric band. Two two of the members are Italian: Cesare Valbusa on drums, and Franz Lazzani on keyboards, and then from Scotland, Alan Thompson on bass. And we haven't got to play together in you know, probably three years now. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. That sounds really cool. Um, here's a question about your guitar line. Um, Russell was asking earlier, uh, a few of the guys have got the John, jo the, 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 Gita the saga, John Jorgensen. You want to talk about that guitar a little bit? How it sure. Came to me and yeah what you um, like in a guitar i was um you know i think i mentioned earlier I, I i'm so lucky to find an original selmer back in 1982 i think and um that was the first gypsy guitar that i ever played so and i was really spoiled because it was also a really good one in the 500 serial number series and so just kind of everything was normal by that time and it's quite good um but it's kind of old and fragile. And then I was at a music mesa in Frankfurt and I saw uh, a Saga Chiton, one of the a DG250 model with a solid headstock and the bird's eye maple. And I recognized it was patterned after a friend of mine had an original like that that I saw years ago. And um, I, I went, wow. This is so good. It, it was such a good guitar. I said, I, I, I don't know how you guys did it, but you did, you know, because everything that was a copy that I'd played before then was pretty horrible. So um, then I, I started working with the company and, and I made some suggestions and why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? And, and eventually that became the DG300 model. And then uh, I wanted to to see what would happen if you put a 14 fret neck on a D hole and that became the 320. And then I just wanted a black, I wanted a black and white guitar. So yeah. that became the 330. And the 330 is the, the black one is probably the most they haven't made as many of those. 
the, the, the 300 is kind of the normal one. They made quite a few of those and 320, maybe not as many, but I still play almost all the time my prototype GG300 uh, when I play live. I'll take other guitars out with me and I end up defaulting to that one. I, I think just I'm used to it and the pickup setup works well with the tone dexter and everything like that, so. That's awesome. Here's one from Christian. Sorry to join late, but love your music, John. There you go. Oh, thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Jerry in Florida says, I saw you in Django Fest Northwest in 21. Any idea when you might be back there? Great show, by the way. In, uh, in Django Fest Northwest? Yeah, say? that's what he says. Um, yeah, I, we'll have to ask our friend Simon Planting. He's now the musical director of the <laughs> Django Fest Northwest. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, and you know, I'll, we'll, we'll return it. I don't think this year is a plan. Maybe next year. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure is the answer. Right. Um, here's a question. Not a question for me, but just an observation. Um, and we've touched on it already in in the intro. But you know, you grew up with classical music. You grew up with the Beatles. Uh, you played Telecaster, kind of the, the country twang sound. Danny Gatton. You play guitar with Elton John in a rock format, playing big, you know, anthems and songs in stadiums. You play the gypsy guitar in the John Jorgensen Quintet. You do your own sound. Um, you, you even played with Martin and Frank recently on a kind of jazz jazz setting. You, you play with the Lost Fingers, who are guys that I know from Canada do, who do a whole kind of show where you play like 15 instruments and, <laughs> and probably dance and stuff as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I love I love the the eclectic thing and and being able to plug in and you're obviously equally as passionate about all these things, right? Yeah, I yeah, pretty much. I I, I just love music and and yeah. I, there's very few styles that I could say I don't like the whole style. You know, I mean, there's some that I'm you know I'm not as fond of like atonal music and that kind of thing and. And I'm not as fond of rap, but but some of it I like, you know, it's it's like, I think within every style, it's sort of like food, you know, you can say, yeah. I don't like Indian food. Well, you just haven't found the one that you like yet, because there, there's probably a dish in any kind of cuisine that you would really like. But, you know, it, it takes some time and experimentation. Yeah. Here's a quick one. John Silver says, which strings do you prefer, 10s or 11s? Uh, probably most of the time tens. Uh, yeah, my, as I, as I'm getting a little older, uh, ease makes a lot more difference to me. I, I think, uh, some guitars really want an 11, you know, some guitars just 10 is too floppy, but, uh, and I'd probably say like, if I was just playing rhythm, 11, definitely, you right. know, right. um, but for lead, it's the tens are a little more forgiving. Right, cool. Um, here we go. Kai says, if there is still time to mention it, I want to say thank you for your inspiration. Besides Robin, you were the one. You, uh, sorry, I'm. You were the one that got me started with the gypsy guitar. I learned your version of the minor swing solo from a guitar mag guitar player, which was published after your work for the movie Head in the Clouds. Still play it today. Thank you very much, says Kai. Oh, you're you're welcome, Kai. It was it was really fun. I mean, I couldn't believe it at the time that somebody was actually going to hire me to study Django songs. And, right. And, uh, right. So it, I probably would never have delved into minor swing as hard as I did with with without having that film because it's so ubiquitous, you know. And but but I did. I really really delved into it, and it was super fun. You know, it's the my biggest takeaway from it was that it's so equal. There's four choruses of Django and they build up and they build up and they build up. And there's four choruses of Stefan and they build up and they build up and they build up. It's, it's just perfectly balanced, you know? And then the chord change at the end of the progression where it goes to E7 to B flat to A minor. So unusual. And yeah. almost no other song does that. And even later versions of minor swing don't do that. But yeah. I love that sound. It's so 
it, it, awesome. It's so kind of angular, it, it kind of it's 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 very cool. Um, John, this is this has been great to chat. Um, the tip of the iceberg. Let's bring it back to when we're going to meet together in uh, Westlake Village in California. March the 30th to April the 2nd is the retreat. John will be joining us on the Sunday. He'll be teaching a workshop. We'll be jamming together. Then we'll be performing together with the students. Um, this is exciting. I'm pretty excited to see you and play, John. Oh, me too. I mean, we've been trying to do this for so long. Uh, you know, we've been sidetracked a, a few times from COVID and travel and all this kind of thing. So uh, it's... I'm I'm just I'm happy that we'll get to do it. Every time I drive past Westlake, I think that's where we're going to be soon. Right. So, right. Yeah, it's yeah, going to be really nice. Yeah, it's a, a our good friend Joe and Justine's place. They got a beautiful house there, and it's a great setting to play guitar. There'll be a small, intimate group. There are still places left. If you're watching this, um, go to RobinNolanRetreats.com. And you can find out more information about it. John will be there. So you can actually hang out with John and learn and play together. And it's going to be really, really special. Um, and everybody, aside from the music, aside from the music and the guitar part of it, uh, you're coming to a very, very nice part of the country. So I don't know if, it, if it's cold or rainy or whatever it is where you are. Uh, Westlake is it's, it's very nice. Yeah. You know? It's gorgeous. You don't live too far from there yourself, right? Not at all. I just live up the road and, and I, I feel so spoiled. I mean, usually when I go, uh, I just had a little sort of playcation at uh, the Dominican Republic where I played with uh, Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. And, uh, but, and it was beautiful. But I think I'm just spoiled because where I live, is a place where a lot of people come for vacation. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I get less impressed by other places as I get older. Um, what would you say? I know a lot of guys uh, get intimidated to think they're not good enough to attend a retreat and kind of go head on into this music. Um, I'm always encouraging, you know, beginners or people from other styles to to dive in. Um, what would you say on that topic? Well, you, you have to start, you know, I mean, uh, you might start and you might go, okay, well, it's not for me, but you might start and you might just love it. And, and I, I think that nobody is, uh, everybody can learn, you know, and it might, you might learn some stuff that you put in some other styles of music that you play. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be intimidated. And it's also not a contest and you're not, it's not, a master class in a classic way where you have to perform and then people are taking notes and judging you. That's horrible. I don't, I, I hate that kind of, you know, so it's not a judgment, you know, and you're not like rated or be rated for sure. You know, it's uh, just around other players and you can pick up stuff and it's just fun. So yeah, don't be intimidated. Perfect. Um, John, it's been really great to chat and catch up and I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks in Westlake village. Um, Me too. Yeah. Thank you everybody for, for coming, joining all around the world. It's, it's uh, fantastic to see the community and, and thank you, Robin. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it and we'll do yeah, it again. Yeah, brilliant. And like I say, there's still places left. Go to Robin Nolan retreats.com info there. Everybody unmute yourself. Give John a shout out. Go on. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. See you, everybody. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. See you soon, I hope. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye-bye.